and welcome to the SheClicks webinar about compact cameras. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of SheClicks. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Tonight we're talking about everything you ever wanted to know about compact cameras. And before we get going, I have a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by MPB, the world's largest platform for used photography and videography kit. MPB has transformed the way that people buy, sell and trade equipment, making photography more accessible, affordable and sustainable. MPB is proud to partner with SheClicks to help support women photographers and their work. So thank you very much to MPB. Um, they have also loaned me a few cameras that I can show you later to just talk about some typical features and things like that. So tonight, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to start off talking about what is a compact camera. Then we'll look at why you might want to use a compact camera, features to look out for if you're thinking about buying a compact camera. And then I'll take you through some just a few example images captured with compact cameras. And then I'll show you a few different compact cameras and highlight some of their key features. And of course, at the end, there is a Q&A session. So let's get started. What is a compact camera? Well, the first thing we all associate with a compact camera is its size. We all think about a compact camera being very small and they can be pretty small. They can also actually be quite large these days. And um, whereas in film days, most, you know, the most popular film format was 35 millimeter film. And you could use that in an SLR, single lens reflex camera, or you could in a rangefinder, and you could use it in a compact camera. And the great thing about that was that, you know, the, me the recording medium was the same, whatever camera you were using. So as long as you had a compact camera with a really good um, lens, you could get results close to what you would get with an SLR. So that was fantastic. Now in digital photography, um, there are a couple of elements to consider. Firstly, if you have a bigger sensor, then you need a bigger lens and you need a bigger camera to house it. If you have a small sensor, you can have a smaller camera and a smaller uh, lens to cover it. Um, but also the sensor is the most expensive part of a camera. So by producing one with a smaller sensor, you will uh, be able to have a more affordable camera. And that kind of triggered the early days of compact cameras. We saw a lot of very small sensors, um, lots of very compact, really compact cameras. But now we're seeing uh, quite a few with larger sensors as well. Now, one of the key characteristics of a compact camera is that they have a fixed lens. That By that, I mean, it's a lens that can't be removed. It could be a prime lens. That's one with a fixed focal length. You can't zoom it, or it could be a zoom lens. A zoom lens. So there is a range of focal lengths. And there are pros and cons to both. Um, a uh, zoom lens is more flexible, but a prime lens is often faster and you've got, you know, really fantastic image quality and things like that. Um, but you can have the, both or either. <laughs> now, it's interesting that compact cameras have more in common with mirrorless cameras than they do SLRs. And that's because an SLR, a single lens reflex camera, has um, a mirror in it, which must lift out of the way to um, let the light path that comes through the lens hit the sensor. That mirror is there to bounce light into the viewfinder. Now, a mirrorless camera doesn't have that. The light goes straight the way through. And when the shutter opens, the light hits the sensor. When the, um, when the shutter is open, when you're, you're working with a mirrorless camera, and therefore you see the live view of uh, you know, the scene. So you're going to see um, a direct view, and you can have the interpretation of all of the camera features, sorry, all of the camera settings. A compact camera works in exactly the same way. It doesn't have a mirror. So uh, the light goes straight through the lens and hits the sensor without having to sort of be bounced off a mirror into a viewfinder or anything like that. So it's quite similar. And although we settled on the name mirrorless cameras or mirrorless cameras, for quite a few people still call them compact system cameras, which is what they were known as in the early days. And the reason they were called that was because they were like a compact camera in that they didn't have a mirror, but they were system cameras in that you could fit a lens to them. So that's where compact system camera comes from. And um, because uh, smartphones have become prevalent, 
they're no most compact cameras now really aren't point and shoot cameras they've gone beyond that because in the early days of, of compact cameras you know with with film and in dig, indeed digital if you looked at the manufacturers a range of cameras they used to produce a huge number of compact cameras and they'd be really quite basic models that you have very few features on you know you just turn it on you might select an option if it was sunny or if it was cloudy or something like that or you might say well i'm going to photograph a person or a landscape and that was about it and you just took your shot but now um you know you can get as many controls on a compact camera as you can on a mirrorless or dslr you know they're really quite sophisticated but it does depend on what you want to go for and you can get some you know there are some more affordable smaller compact cameras which are very simple but most of them have some de more degree of control than you used to get so why would you want to use a compact camera well the first thing is, you know, the point I made initially about they're small, they're compact in size. So often you can slip them in a pocket and even the larger ones, you might not put them in your jeans pocket, but you could probably put them in a coat pocket. You could put them in a small handbag or you can put them on a strap and carry them around and they're not going to weigh you down, you know, on a, a day out or an evening out or anything like that. They're really convenient to carry. They also have a larger sensor and lens than a smartphone. And we're familiar with talking about different size sensors in cameras and the significance of that but it's also worth thinking about the size of the lens as well and if you look at your smartphone um, you'll see you know generally the lenses on those cameras are really small in diameter but also if you look at the thickness of the the phone then you realize there's not much depth to them either and so you can't get a great deal of glass in there and you're, you're quite limited whereas with a compact camera you've got a bit more scope to get something in so where you can have, um, you know, it'll be bigger in diameter, so it can let more light in, but also it will um, be deeper. And instead of with some phones, they will actually have like a periscope design so that the light will come in and go round a corner, um, it gets reflected round. It's, um, but that is the only way they can get any depth. Whereas with a compact camera, you often see them, you turn them on and the lens extends. So you get a bit more room for the optics, which is a good thing for image quality. You also get real aperture control. Now we've become used to smartphones often offering aperture control, but this is actually computational. It's not really aperture control. It's um, a kind of, it's an application of an understanding of what happens when you use a wide aperture or a small aperture. So if you've got a wide aperture, you get shallow depth of field and the background blurs. And what the, the, what the smartphone does, it, it looks at the image and sort of works out what's the subject and then blurs the background. If you use a real aperture, you get that effect happening naturally. And the camera doesn't have to work out, you know, what's supposed to be the subject and cut around it. So you don't get any artificial um, sort of sudden changes in sharpness. You don't get objects which are actually quite close to the lens being sharp because they overlie the subject and the camera, the phone can't work out whether they're near or far and all that kind of thing. So you get a more, you get more control, but you also get a more natural looking result. You also have less compression of the images than a smartphone. If you think, I don't know about you, but if I, you know, I, I do use a smartphone um, for, for, for photography, just for, you know, for fun and when I'm out and things like that. And you can get thousands of pictures on a smartphone and it never seems to fill up. Um, but, you know, a card, an SD card or, you know, a CF Express card, something like that, that will fill up comparatively quickly and that's because although you might be taking you know same number of pixels in an image actually the level of compression makes the file size on a smartphone's image so small that you can get thousands in a relatively small capacity um, storage area whereas with a compact camera there's less compression so you can get fewer images and the benefit of that is that when you you know in challenging conditions or when you've got a you know a tricky subject or whether you want to edit your image there is more information there for you to carry out any processing you can blow it up more it will be basically it's a, a fundamentally better quality image also you know some people tend to think of uh that a fixed lens can be a bit limiting but they can also be very liberating and it's really a sort of question of how you think about things I mean if you um, if you go out with a bag uh, a camera and a bag of lenses then sometimes that can be quite distracting because you're constantly sort of assessing whether you should be swapping to another lens and should you be doing this should you be doing that if you go out with just one lens or one camera with one lens fixed on it 
you're there and you're in the moment and you can just concentrate on what you've actually got and work with that, which I think is sometimes a really good way of just relaxing into your photography. Um, and of course, it means you don't have anything else to carry, which is good news. You've just got to make sure the battery's charged. You've got a card in there with no images on and you format it and you're ready to go. Another benefit of not swapping lenses is there's much less chance of dust getting onto the sensor so you don't have to worry about sensor cleaning. And another feature of uh, cameras with relatively small sensors is that you get lots of depth of field, which means, you know, when you're photographing landscapes, you get a lot of things sharp. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you're on holiday and you want to photograph of somebody in front of a great scene or, you know, somewhere you've been, something like that, then you will get them sharp and you can get the background sharp. And they just, you know, it's it's really useful feature. You don't have to worry about taking control, um, you know, making sure you've got all the settings right and everything. It will generally uh, deliver the result you want. But if you know what you're doing, if you zoom in a bit and you say so you're closer to the subject and you use a wider aperture, you can get shallow depth of field as well. So it's just worth bearing in mind there are pros and cons. Also, as I mentioned before, because these cameras work um, like mirrorless cameras, they're in permanent live view mode. So when you look at the screen on the back of the camera, and in most cases, when you look in the viewfinder, if they've got one, then you will see the image that you're going to capture and you'll see it with all of the camera settings applied. So you can visualize what you're actually going to get, which is really useful. So things like the exposure, uh, the white balance and the color are all evident. Now let's look at a few features to look out for when you're thinking about getting a compact camera. Now, the first subject is uh, sensor size. And we have, uh, you know, we're kind of familiar with talking about sensor size um, when we talk about APS-C and four thirds or micro four thirds and full frame, full frame cameras. We kind of have an understanding of what they're like as a full frame camera. Its sensor is the same size as a 35 millimeter uh, film frame. APS-C is roughly half that and four thirds is a little bit smaller than that. So we kind of got where we're going with that. But the, with compact cameras, there are often measurements given in inches. And we're familiar with terms like uh, one over 2.3 inches or a one inch or a half inch type sensor. And it's a little bit uh, confusing. Um, I don't want to say deceptive, but it's a little bit confusing because that isn't actually the measurement of the sensor. It's It uh, comes from a time when we used to talk about sensors when they were inside a Vidicon tube, which is uh, like a glass tube. And the dimension is actually the diameter of that tube rather than the sense the, rather than the sensor. So when we're talking about a one over um, 2.3 inch sensor, we're talking something that's more like 6.3 millimeters by 4.7 millimeters, which is quite a bit smaller than you might think. And a one inch sensor is about 13.2 uh, to, to by eight by sorry eight point eight millimeters. So it's you know it's a bit smaller than an inch. Another thing to factor in is um, focal length and zoom range. Now, obviously, when you're looking at a camera, sort of looking at the marketing information, usually you'll see terms like you know twenty four to seventy and those kind of numbers, but when you actually look at the lens on the camera, it might be a bit confusing because it might say something like, I don't know, um, 8.8 .8 to 25 millimeters. And you're thinking, well, I, you know, that's a bit confusing because I didn't, I didn't think it had a, a lens as short as that. But that's because the 24 to 70 is the taking the focal length magnification factor into account. Again, this is something we're familiar with with um, mirrorless cameras because we know that when we talk about full frame, that's a it, it's a one times focal length magnification factor. So if you have put a 35 millimeter lens on, then it looks like a 35 millimeter lens. But if you um, put that onto say an APS-C format camera, it looks like a 50 mil lens because it's the sensor is slightly smaller and it zooms in. And with micro four thirds, it's two times focal length uh, magnification factors so it would be a 70 mil lens. But we don't tend to talk about focal length magnification factors with compact cameras but it is there. So that's why you will see a difference between sort of like the marketing speak about a camera and it's a compact camera's focal length and what it's, the lens is actually marked as. And when we talk about zoom range, sometimes you might see 
a camera referred to as having a five times zoom range and that's or, or three times or, or ten times something like that and that basically is if you look at the the widest or the shortest focal length and the longest focal length you divide one by the other so uh, say a, a 24 to um 24 to 70 is roughly a three times zoom and a 24 to 120 is um, a five times zoom. And it's just a convenient way of kind of giving an indication of how much zoom power you've got. Another point to consider is the aperture range. Now, um, the size of the maximum aperture that a, that a camera has or a lens has, plays a key role in how big it is you know firstly it's got to produce an image circle that will cover the sensor but then also you know if the aperture size is important as well so often with compact cameras you know they can have nice bright uh lenses you know you might see 1.8 and uh, 2.8 things like that which is fantastic but um bear in mind that just like many lenses that you buy for an interchangeable lens camera the folk the sorry the aperture uh, the maximum aperture may change uh, with focal length as you zoom in sometimes the maximum aperture becomes a bit smaller and that may only reduce from say 1.8 to 2.8 which is still nice and fast but sometimes it might go a bit smaller still so it's just something to bear in mind also with some of the the more affordable compact cameras sometimes you know the, it has an aperture range but actually there's only a couple of aperture settings there's maybe two or three so again something to bear in mind you might not have quite the level of control with the more affordable cameras than you do with the more expensive ones um, the kind of uh, more luxury compact cameras now there was a time we went through a phase where compact cameras just didn't seem to have viewfinders and um, you know it was it was quite painful really because um, it's fine in sort of average conditions, but when you're outside in bright light, it's really hard to see um, the screen in really bright sunshine. And often, you know, people want to take a compact camera on holiday; they want to take it to the beach and all this sort of stuff. And if it's bright sunshine on your holiday, you can't see your images very well, so you can't compose them well. And over time, I, you know, manufacturers realised this and they also worked out ways of shrinking down viewfinders and making them of acceptable quality. And so now more compact cameras have a viewfinder. And sometimes it might look like the camera doesn't have a viewfinder, but there's a pop up one. So it's just worth looking out for that. Another feature that I find very useful on any camera is a tilting or a very angle screen, because as I mentioned before, you know, if, if you're when when you're looking at the back of the camera, you know, it's a nice it's a bigger view than looking through the viewfinder. But um, if you want to shoot from low level or high level, it's much more convenient if you can and easier to see and compose the image if you can tilt the screen or flip it round. Um, and I think one of the benefits of compact cameras, particularly when they're small, is that they make you want to do, you know, take shots in cramped spaces and, you know, photograph daisies from the bottom up and things like that. So that's really when you want to have a tilting or a very angle screen that lets you get the shot without actually having to lie on the ground. Another point to look out for is the exposure modes. Now, um, you know, most cameras, as I say now, they do have the kind of exposure modes that you might expect so program aperture priority shutter priority manual and then there will be some usually some scene modes and an auto mode that helps um in you know tricking conditions or you just want to have you turn your brain off for a little bit um so that that's great uh but some you know just keep an eye out and make sure that those modes exist because you don't want to buy a camera which is only auto Another thing to bear in mind is now I think most compact cameras or you know most above a certain level also let you record raw files as well as JPEG and that's great because that gives you a nice um, level of control so you've got the option to shoot as you want the, you know the JPEG nice and quickly in camera you can do what you want with it but the raw file you can tweak the processing and and just get the image to be exactly what you want. It's also worth looking out for some special features. Now I'm thinking of, you know, there are a few manufacturers who make waterproof cameras. Uh, the Olympus Tough TG range, for example. I mean, that's an excellent range of cameras that are highly waterproof. And you can take these cameras, you know, snorkeling, you can um, 
put them in a pond if you want to photograph tadpoles and all this sort of thing. So they open up some interesting photographic opportunities that you wouldn't normally do with your average camera unless you got, you know, very expensive um, housing or something like that. So that they make that sort of thing easy. And also, you know, if you want to teach your kids or your grandchildren to uh, photography and just help them learn about composition and having fun with a camera, it doesn't matter if they drop it in a muddy puddle or they drop it on the beach and it gets all sandy because you can just rinse it off. So I think that's a really nice feature. Um, other modes that you tend to see might be things like, uh, you know, panorama mode. I'm probably familiar with that, um, you know, idea of it just being able to pan the camera so it pieces together um, a nice sort of letterbox image. So just keep an eye out for some of the, the special features or USPs, unique selling points that some cameras may offer. Now I've got some example images. Uh, so this image uh, was shot on the Canon PowerShot G5X Mark II, and I've shot it at f11, 250th of a second, and 125th, um, 125, sorry, ISO sensitivity. And I've obviously focused on the foreground, but I've still got pretty good depth of field so that um, the background looks nice and sharp. And I think this is, you know, typical kind of conditions where a, a compact camera really fares well, you know, nice bright conditions and sun, you get really nice vibrant colours, excellent image. You don't, you don't look at this and immediately think, oh, well, that was captured on a compact camera. This is another one. Um, so this is again, Canon power shot, but it's a G7X Mark III f11 again lots of depth of field um and nice bright colors but it's you know great holiday camera out for a walk saw a scene take a shot and you know there's plenty of depth of field this image is actually slightly cropped so you're not seeing all of it it's, it's it was in i think 4.3 format but it's um it's cropped to 16.9 so you're not seeing the full top and bottom but you can see there's plenty of detail and it's filling the screen very nicely now, I wanted to show you this because um, just to show that you can restrict depth of field if you want to. And in this instance, I've gone in quite close and um, I'm probably using the longer end of the, uh, the lens so that it that because that limits depth of field as you go close and as you um, ex use longer focal lengths, you get less less depth of field. Um, I've also used an in camera black and white mode and. You know, I think this is actually quite a nice result for an in-camera black and white mode. If I was processing the raw file, I'd probably add a little more contrast, make the blacks a bit darker. But, you know, it's a nice result from the camera. And more importantly, I think the, the shallow depth of field works really well. Another shot to demonstrate how you can get shallow depth of field with a compact camera. And um, you can see here, I've shot at f8 because I am very close and I, you know, I don't want to completely lose all the depth of field. So focusing on the middle of that foreground flower, I've got all the center sharp and there's a little bit of the petals sharp, but actually, you know, the fall off is relatively rapid. The background is nice and smooth and you just got, you can see that that's a flower in the background, but it's, it's nicely soft. Now, some cameras, and I'll show you this uh, later, you can vary the um, aspect ratio. And I'm a big fan of uh, changing or thinking about aspect ratio at the shooting stage. And so this is the Lumix LX100 Mark II. And I, you can see I've shot it in square mode. But what I think is particularly interesting with this scene is this is quite a high contrast scene. And even though, you know, um, it is high contrast. The depth, the, the uh, dynamic range is pretty good. So there is still quite a bit of detail in the highlights and also the shadows aren't completely blocked up. And I think many smartphones would do one of two things with this scene. They'd either lose the shadows to preserve the highlights and you should get, you know, you would, there wouldn't be very much in that kind of uh, on the left hand side of the image there. Or they would go full on HDR mode, which I know, uh, you know, Mark, I've got an iPhone. Uh, 12 Pro and that does tend to have quite a strong HDR effect automatically so what you end up with is kind of like a an image where you basically want to go in and darken the shadows a little bit just to take out some because everything just looks like too much like a mid-tone so I think we say there's a compact camera this has handled it very well this is another one from the LX100 and if you look at the squirrel, you'd sort of think, oh, well, the details aren't very clear there, but that's the painting style. If you look at the, the blues and the greys on the left and then look at the detail within, you know, of the wood that's been painted, you start to realise there's a lot of detail there. 
if you look at the artist's shadow, at the, you know, um, he's just hunkered down by the squirrel. You can, sorry, his figure. You can look at his T-shirt. You can see there is detail in the highlights and they transition nicely to the shadow where there is still detail. And you can see it's not just the wash of grey. You can see detail within his T-shirt. So, you know, you can get really good quality out of a compact camera. This was shot with the Fujifilm X100F, and um, I don't think I've quite nailed the focus on this chap's eyes, but look again, look at the detail. Um, there's really nice dynamic range. I could probably pull the highlights back a little bit more on his hands because it's still there. This is just the JPEG. I also shot raw file. His skin tones look natural, um, although actually I think this is in, in classic chrome, so there's a slight kind of brownie effect to it, but the detail of the skin on his face is great. The detail of his the hair on his face and um, and on his arms is is really nice. And I shot at uh, four point five, so we've got relatively shallow depth of field. So it's just worked quite well. And we couldn't have a she clicks webinar without Otto appearing. This is when he was quite a young pup again with the X one hundred F, and I've shot at two point eight deliberately to um, limit the depth of field. So it's his eyes are the main point of focus. And I've used 500th of a second because he's a fidgety little thing and he was moving around quite a bit, which means that the sensitivity, the ISO has gone up to 1,250. But there's not a huge amount of, de uh, sorry, there's not a huge amount of noise there. It looks really good. It's nice and smooth. There's plenty of detail uh, of, on his fur and on his nose. So again, you know, with the right, camera and the, knowing what you're doing you can get some really nice results okay so now i am going to switch to showing you some compact cameras so this is probably what we all imagine when we're talking about a compact camera this is the sony cybershot rx100 mark 5 they're up to mark 7 at the moment um but the thing is with the although they did come out in sequence from you know 100 to the mark 2 mark 3 mark 5 they didn't automatically one didn't necessarily replace the other so actually while they're at the mark 7 the mark 6 and 7 are quite different from this camera but they don't necessarily it doesn't they don't replace it they have some slightly different features so for example this camera has um its effective focal length is 24 to 70 millimeters so when i was talking earlier about you can, can you see on the lens there it's marked 8.8 .8 to 25.7. That, because there is a one inch type sensor, equates to a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. And you can see that it's a 1.8 to 2.8 lens, which is a really nice, fast um, aperture. You know, a lot of photographers, they would use a 24, 70, 2.8. A lot of pros would use that as their workhorse lens every day day in, day out. So it's a nice choice of optic. Um, and the fact is, okay, it's a variable aperture, but you've got 1.8 at 24 mil, which is really nice. Um, I'm just going to turn it on. And you can see the lens extends out. So that's what we're talking about. It, you know, it's, it's nice and compact to carry. But um, the lens pops out and you just you just don't get that with a with the smartphone. Uh, this particular camera also you can shoot at 24 frames a second, which is really nice. And that's with the autofocus um, and um, metering tracking, which is really impressive. And that is one of the key features of this camera. Actually, it's got a phase detection autofocus system, which is kind of the best. That, and it's what you get in some great mirrorless cameras in DSLRs. Um, it's a really good autofocus system. Um, the other feature that's really nice here is that you've got a pop-up screen. So there we go. You can see me when I'm filming this on. Um, so that's great if you want to shoot selfies. It's great for vlogging. It's really handy if you know you want to take a group photo. You pop the camera on a little tripod, maybe a a Manfrotto Pixie or something like that. You pop it on, you can see yourself, put it on self timer, drop back. So that's nice. And then this is a great example. Oh, let me just make sure this is 
in focus so you can see what's going on. There we go. See where it says finder. If I just pull that down there, it can be set. Like I have set it to um, start the camera as well. That is a little pop-up electronic viewfinder. The important thing to remember about this is that you need to pull that rear element out because if you don't, if you look through the lens, if you look through the viewfinder when it's like that, it will seem very blurry. You need to pull it out that last little bit to make sure that it's sharp. Um, as I said, this has got a 24 to 70 mil lens. The RX106 and 7 have got 24 to 200 mil lenses. So they are different. Um, they are designed to complement this rather than replace it. Another nice feature, you can see we've got this ring here. By default, that adjusts the aperture. Now that's a customizable feature. So you can change it to adjust something else. Maybe you want to adjust exposure compensation or something like that. But um, I would probably leave it on that because I think that's really handy. You've got um, a mode dial here. So again, you know, you've got the settings you expect, program, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual. Okay, so that is the um, Sony Cybershot RX100 Mark V. Now, there's a lot of technology in this. You know, I mentioned the incredible autofocus. I mentioned, you know, the pop-up viewfinder and its teeny tiny size and the fact it's got a one inch sensor in that small space. It um, is not a cheap camera. <laughs> this retails for around uh, 900 pounds new. So, you know, it's, it's not cheap. Obviously you can uh, get it a more affordably at second hand. So that is the RX100 Mark V. I'm just going to move on now to the next camera, which is this one. So this is the Canon PowerShot G5X Mark II. All snappy names, aren't they? PowerShot G5X Mark II. Um, again, this has got a 20.1 million pixel sensor. And again, it's a one inch type sensor. But the difference with this is that the lens rather than being 2470 is a 24 to 120 millimeter lens, which is really um, a nice range because, you know, 70 mil is about is, is quite nice for um, portraits, but having 120 just gives you that little bit more scope to go closer. Um, and it just makes the camera a little bit more varied. The aperture range is also 1.8 to 2.8. So at the 70 mil, sorry, at the 120 mil end, you still have an aperture of 2.8, which means there's quite a bit of potential for blurring the background, but also you can still get quite fast shutter speeds when um, light levels drop. So this would be called five times zoom. It can also shoot at 20 frames a second. Um, and it also has a tilting screen. Now, Canon is a bit more on board with touch control. So you get a certain amount of touch control as well. Um, you know, you can pretty much do everything. There's lots, there's quite a few control buttons and dials, but you can do a lot using the um, screen, which I find really useful. Um, again, we have got a mode dial here, so you can set all the modes that you want. And really nice feature, I think, is an exposure compensation dial. So and it's, it's, it's really good actually, because it's nicely protected around here, which means you've only got this area and it's, it's, it's kind of exposed, you know, as you pull it out of a pocket or your bag. So it's unlikely to shift. Uh, another nice feature like the um, RX100, it's got this control ring. You just see it there around the lens. And uh, again, that is adjusting aperture but it, it, it is customizable by the menu. So you could adjust something else if you want. But again, I think, you know, aperture, it's a good choice because I, I tend to shoot in aperture priority quite a lot, um, either aperture priority or, or manual. So aperture priority, um, it's really handy to be able to set it quickly. Um, and there we go, we have a pop-up. Let me just do that again. So on the side, we've got the switch here. Just make sure that's in focus for you doesn't want to focus. There we go. So we have a switch here. Just pull that down. That pops out. And again, you just need to pull that rear element out so that it looks sharp. And that's an electronic viewfinder. Um, same as with the Sony, which means that what you see in there is the same as you see on the screen. 
So it's a kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a feed, an electronic feed from the sensor. So you see all the white balance settings and the exposure settings adjusting. Okay, so I think that's everything. And so this, this is the current model. Um, oh, and just before I put this to one side, the other thing that's worth pointing out with this camera is that it's got a really nice, I'll hold it that way. You can see it's got a really nice grip there. So, and it's kind of rubberized, rubberized so it's, it feels comfortable in your hands. There's also a grip on the back. So, you know, there are lugs as usual for putting a strap on, but you could just carry this in your hand. And I, I'm pretty sure that's how I, when I was testing this camera, I just walked around holding it like that. So um, it's nice from that point of view. If you, just in case you want to see it alongside the RX100, you see it's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit bigger, but not a great deal. Um, it's so, but you get more of a grip and you've got a bit more of, of a zoom range. And that uh, is a little bit more expensive, sorry, a little bit more affordable actually, because new that's about 850 quid. And if you were looking for a good quality um, secondhand version, I think you could probably like, get that for about 730 pounds, something like that. So, you know, there's, there's some significant savings to be had there. Obviously, there are lots of um, much, you know, more affordable compact cameras, but um, there, you know, I wanted to show you some of the exciting features that you can get with uh, more advanced compact cameras. So this here is the Panasonic Lumix LX100 Mark II, which is, you remember I showed you a couple of pictures, there was the square one of the, um, the, the wharf, you know, with the, um, that I said was really good dynamic range, and also the guy painting the squirrel. So this is it. And the interesting feature about this, or there's several interesting features, but it has got a four thirds type sensor. And it's a little bit different because it uses Panasonic's uh, multi-aspect um, technology, which means that the sensor is actually a bit bigger than is used in any of the aspect ratios, which I know sounds a bit strange because normally, you know, the aspect ratio, the native aspect ratio of most sensors is, is, is four by three in combat cameras. Um, but even when you're shooting in four three, this, um, this camera doesn't use the whole sensor area. And when you switch to 16 nine or, or one, it, it, or one to one, it, it changes so that um, you're getting the sort of maximum um, area you can rather than cropping within. So, um, and the other thing is that when you switch aspect ratio, the, um, the view angle doesn't change that you get from the lens. So that's quite a nice feature. And so Panasonic has put this switch here that lets you slide between the different aspect ratio settings. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of setting aspect ratio at the shooting stage because um, it makes you think about composition a little bit more. And if you're a, uh, you know, an Instagram fan, then if you shoot in square, then you know that you can put your images straight onto Instagram, things like that. So it's just a nice feature. Um, another feature of this lens, it's got a, a Leica lens, which means it, it's made by Panasonic, but it's built to the standards approved by Leica. So it's a really high quality lens. Um, it is a um, 24 to 75 millimeter lens and it has an aperture range of 1.7 to 2.8 so again it's nice and bright and you get some some really great results from this lens um, there is an aperture ring so rather than sort of having it on the screen you have an aperture ring here that you can set from 16 all the way down to 1.7 and you can adjust it into in one third stops now if you set it to a the camera the camera will set the aperture automatically. If I was to then turn this shutter speed dial here to A, it will set the shutter speed automatically. So we are effectively in auto mode. The camera is taking control of the exposure. You can adjust it a bit using the exposure compensation dial here. Um, or I could leave that on A and I can set an aperture using the aperture ring. And now I'm in aperture priority mode. So instead of having a mode dial with AV on it, um, we set them using these, uh, what we call, you know, traditional exposure controls. And I mentioned earlier, I really like um, having an exposure mode dial, sorry, an exposure compensation dial because it's quick to adjust. It's a feature that you, you often want to tweak the exposure from, um, from one setting to the, sorry, one image to the next. 
and it's just really nice to be able to adjust it quickly by a dial rather than having to press a button and then rotate a dial. It's got a fixed screen, but there is a built-in viewfinder just here. It's not a pop-in, it's, it's, you know, pop-out one, it's, it's permanently there, you can see it. Um, so it's, you know, really handy thing in bright conditions. There are a couple of other neat features. There's a, a macro mode and at the widest point, you can shoot with the um, lens three centimeters from the subject and at the telephoto end, it's 30 centimeters. So you can get really nice and close. There are some clever features like post focus, focus stacking, uh, light composition and, you know, so you can um, shoot so that uh, you get a, a focus stacked image, light composition. It's really useful for things like um, fire, firework displays and things like that because you take a shot and then you take another one and it won't actually make the darker areas any brighter. It only photographs the, um, only photographs the, the, the light areas. So it would be the um, fireworks themselves. Now uh, I've got another Canon PowerShot camera. If I just get, so this was the previous PowerShot camera. So we've stepped up in size a little bit, but not a huge amount. And what we get with this one. So this is the Canon PowerShot G1X Mark III, and it has a very angle screen, which is a nice thing. Um, you can flip it forward for shooting selfies. There we go. Just shot one. Um, or vlogging and that kind of thing. And you can also angle it for shooting from low level or high, le high level, shooting above your head, that kind of thing. Um, it has, now this is the really interesting thing about this camera, I think, it's uh, got an APS-C format sensor and it's a 24.2 million pixel sensor. So APS-C is um, one of the most popular formats for mirrorless cameras and SLRs. It's just kind of like, it's the size down from uh, full frame. Um, so basically you've got the same kind of sensor in here as you have in some SLRs and mirrorless cameras, but in a very small size. And it's it's got a mini DSLR style. I'm just gonna pop that in there, uh, which means that the, uh, the viewfinder is in the middle, which seems like a nice logical place. You know, you're used to it with an SLR and many mirrorless cameras. Um, we've got the exposure compensation dial here. We've got the um, exposure mode dial here all quite straightforward. And again, we've got this really nice grip. Just hold it that way. It'd be better to show it that way, actually. So it's a really nice grip. Again, kind of rubberized, slightly bigger than on the other camera. And there's a good thumb grip there. That, um, trying to get the light on it just right. You can see that's a good grip. So that's another one, you know, you can put it on, on a strap, but you can carry it quite comfortably just in one hand. It's nice and light. It's certainly you know, you don't need a second hand to support this camera. It works extremely well. Um, the other thing to bear in mind with this, it's got a dual pixel CMOS sensor, which means that it's got really good auto focusing. Um, at, so they're phase detection points um, and it works well in, in video mode as well as stills mode. And again, there is a dial which is customizable. And uh, the default setting for that is zoom. But again, it uh, is customizable. And just to show that against the smallest camera that we had so far, the Sony. So you can see it's a bit bigger, but it's not massive. And um, but uh, it's reasonably expensive camera because you're getting a lot here. If you think about it, you know, it's a bit like an SLR. Um, so this is about £1,140 new, but, uh, you know, you can probably get it for about 720 secondhand, something like that. So it's a nice, versatile, compact camera. Now, sticking with APS-C format, here we have a Fujifilm X100F. Now this has been replaced by the X100V, um, which does make a few uh, significant upgrades. You know, there's a different sensor in here, different processor, a few things like that. But this 
is still an extremely good compact camera. And, um, you know, if you were to buy this, so you can't buy this new, or there might be some store that's got one tucked away that's still new. But so this, um, if you buy this like new from a secondhand um, retailer, maybe MPB, it will cost you about £820, something like that. And what is a bit different about this camera is it has a, a prime lens. So whereas the others have all been zoomed, this has a prime lens. It's a 23 millimeter lens and it's an F2 maximum aperture. So it's a really nice, bright um, lens. And because it's an APS-C format sensor, that translates into, that 23 millimeters translates into 35 millimeters in full frame terms. So, uh, you know, that's a really popular range. It's a class, sorry, popular um, focal length. It's a classic for street photography, reportage, um, documentary, but it's also nice for um, environmental portraiture and you know, landscapes or just days out. Um, you know, I, I really like using 35 mil lenses because you can, you, they're so versatile and you can, you know, you can walk closer to a subject or further away and use them that way. And say so it's, um, it's also got traditional exposure control. So you've got this aperture in here, which goes all the way. Sorry, I'm just gonna make sure that's sharp. There we go. So it goes all the way to F from F2 to F16. And there's the A setting. So the camera is setting the aperture now. It's also set to A on the shutter speed dial. So that is setting the exposure automatically. But I could elect to, sorry, I'm just doing that wrong way. I could elect to set the shutter speed and let the camera take control of the aperture. Or I could go back to A and set an aperture. So I'm now in aperture priority mode. Now you may notice these numbers here. That is the ISO or sensitivity. And you adjust that by lifting this dial and then rotating. And as with the other two dials, there's an A setting. So if you set it to A, the camera will set the um, ISO automatically. And that's really useful. You know, if you want to shoot in manual mode, you set the ISO to A. So I've just accidentally set it. There we go. Set that to A. And then we set a shutter speed that we think is going to freeze whatever we're looking at or blur whatever we're looking at sufficiently. And then we set the aperture that we want and the camera will take control of the sensitivity. We've also got um, an exposure compensation dial here, which is a really nice feature. The viewfinder is built in and this is quite unique because or unique to Fujifilm and to the X100 series. It's um, a hybrid viewfinder. Now, if I just turn the camera on. Um, it combines both an electronic and an optical viewfinder. So if I, it's actually in optical mode at the moment because I can see through it. If I flick this little switch here, is it is now in electronic mode. So as an electronic viewfinder, you can use that or you flick that and you go to the optical viewfinder. Now with the electronic viewfinder, you're seeing the image through the lens hitting the sensor with the optical viewfinder. Uh, put simply, you're seeing the view through the glass there. And there's, you know, some clever things going on to try and collect, correct for the parallax error of that being there and the lens being here. But equally, you can switch to um, electronic mode if you want, which is very nice. Um, there is a little uh, joystick here, which lets you set the autofocus point, which is neat. And um, one of the differences between this and the X100V is that this pad isn't here anymore and you just have a you just have the joystick everything's done by the joystick if I just open the quick menu you can see that's really it's one of the best ones to use because you just navigate to the option you want and then you change which is really nice now I'm just going to go to the main menu. Another nice feature about Fujifilm cameras is you get the film simulation modes. And they are like, your, you know, your JPEG interpretation. They, they give the, the image a certain look and uh, Fujifilm does a great job with them. They're some of the most attractive sort of out of camera results you can get. Um, so, and they match Fujifilm's uh, film stock that uh, they used to or still do in some cases uh, produce. So Provia or Standard, Velvia is a Vivid, 
Uh, Astur is nice and soft. A classic chrome is one of my favorites. And I'm pretty sure that portrait I showed you was shot in classic chrome because it's it's got a kind of like slightly muted tones and a slightly warmish, earthy look to the colors. If you scroll down, there's also Astia. Sorry, Acros, what I'm talking about. Acros, which is a really nice uh, black and white. It's, it's much better than it's sometimes these black and white modes used to be just like a desaturation, but this is much nicer than that. And you can set various filter effects as well. And that, that replicates traditional filter effects. Uh, so yeah, so that is the Fujifilm X100F. And I'm just gonna show it alongside so again, you know, it's it's a step up in size, but um, this has an APS-C size sensor, whereas this has a one inch type sensor. Also, it's worth noting there's quite a nice, it's a subtle grip, but it's effective on this. Um, there's not much on the back, but there's just an effective grip on the front. Right. So now just to show you something a little bit different, this is a full frame compact camera. It's a Leica. So you know automatically this is not a cheap compact camera. This is a high quality, um, extraordinarily well built compact camera. Its lens is 28 millimeters and um, it's a 1.7 aperture. So, you know, it's nice and bright. It's really fast. It's um, it feels very much like a Leica um, M series camera. The lens is extremely nice. Um, and sharp, excellent results. We've got an aperture ring here, again with the A setting, going from 1.7 all the way up to F16. And we've got the shutter speed dial. There we go. And this is used for uh, adjusting. Let's turn that on and we can adjust the exposure compensation. I've got it in manual at the moment, let's just do that. There we go. So. There we go. So that's a nice feature. And also Leica is very good at, um, it doesn't tend to have a lot of complex settings, which means that the, um, the, the menu is, is sort of shorter, but it's also, they are very good at um, organizing menus and keeping things simple. So, you know, you can quickly get to the sensitivity setting um, and the menu. These are the favorites which are customizable, but then you scroll down and you're in the main menu. And you can see there are only five tabs in that main menu. And every time I press menu, it will go to the next page. So you can quickly navigate through all the options. So that's very nice, but um, this retails for uh, about two and a half thousand pounds in that second hand. Um, there is a Q2 which is roughly twice that price, but it has a full frame 47 million pixel sensor. So it's kind of like a considerable step up. So I just wanted to show you that, to show you that, you know, it's, it's not huge, but in compact camera terms, it's quite big. So I'll just show you the, the Sony alongside. So we've jumped up in size quite a bit there. Okay, so I think it's probably time for questions. We go back to that. So do we have any questions? I can see a couple of questions already. Okay, so we have a question um, basically asking for a camera recommendation. Well, I would recommend any of those that I just showed you. Have any got viewfinders? I, all of the cameras I just showed you had viewfinders. It's just a question of whether you want to pop up one or um, a, you know one that's permanently there. I quite like the pop-up ones. I think it's really neat. Um, any of those cameras, the PowerShot, uh, Canon PowerShot range is excellent. All of these cameras are very, very capable. Um, you may, I don't know, but you might find some benefit from getting one with a tilting screen. But what I would suggest is that you look um, at the options, you know, write a list of features that you want and then see what's available because, um, you know, that will help you find the right one for you. So I was saying that she has five cameras, but 90% of her shots are taken with her little Fuji X100S. Yes, it's often the case. I remember uh, my dad at one point, he had three cameras. He had a, 
he had an SLR and a full frame SLR and two different compact cameras, you know, one being quite a bit bigger than the other, obviously different sensor sizes. And uh, he realized that every time he went away, he took all three cameras with him, but left two of them in the hotel room and always shot in his compact. So we had a, a bit of a rethink about that. Uh, right, does the Canon G5X Mark II offer a macro facility? Let me have a look. Let me find it first. There we go. I think it does go quite close actually. Yes, it does. It's got a, I can't tell you exactly what the numbers are, but it does have a macro setting. Here we have a macro setting just there. Get this in focus. There we go. You can see that macro setting. I've activated it. You can see it there. Now, if I, you see, we're actually there. You can focus on that keyboard that close. put it in a tracking mode which wasn't the best thing to do there we go so it, it will go pretty close all right enjoy the rest of your evening bye bye <laughs>